I thank the Times for joining the library and our commitment to enrich this community with stories and information. The library and the Times keep the history of Seattle and keep us informed about our present. We have a long offered access, we have all long offered access to the historical, physical, and digital edition of the Times, in addition to the many other historical and news resources at the library. The ability of everyone to share stories, learn from the past, and stay connected to trusted information are critical for our democracy, and maybe even more today with the things that we see in censorship and book banning. So thank you all for your support. This event is a great opportunity to look back at the photos and stories that defined each year in our city. I'm really looking forward to tonight's program and hearing from some outstanding photojournalists and videographers. I want to give a special thanks to Phil Rowe and Danny Galowski at the Times who are doing all the work behind the scenes again this year. And Times publisher and CEO Frank Blethen, who is here tonight. I got a chance to speak with Frank. Thank you for coming tonight. Now it's my great pleasure to turn over the program to Angela Gottschalk, Director of Photography at the Times. Over to you, Angela. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to the Seattle Public Library for having us back here to present our annual Pictures of the Year show. As Tom said, it's been four years since we were here in person, which seems like way too long. Seeing all of you out there is super gratifying, and it's just really great to be back. Whether you're a longtime subscriber or new to consuming news on various Seattle Times platforms, we're really glad you're here. The Seattle Times has been owned by the Blethyn family for the last 127, going on 128 years. That's a pretty impressive, <laughs> it's a pretty impressive run of strong, committed local journalism, and one that we're proud of and grateful for. So many things have changed as the city and surrounding areas have evolved, along with the technology used to produce our work. However, our mission remains the same as we strive to enlighten and inform our audience by providing a steady diet of news, features, sports, and other coverage. Tonight, we're here to celebrate a commitment to photojournalism. Photos are usually the first thing that readers see when they open the paper or look at our website. The impact can be unmistakable and long-lasting. In the split second it takes to record an image, that visual has the capacity to grab your attention and pull you into a story that you may not have even known you were interested in reading. It's our job to place you right in the midst of the people and places that make our city and surrounding areas unique. We want you to experience life's joys and sorrows, tender moments and harsh realities along with us. We also want you to be awed by the beauty and richness of Pacific Northwest wonder on display. Be it from up in the air, on or in the water, or in someone's workplace or living room, we aim to introduce you to faces in our community and help you get to know people that you might not meet otherwise. We also want to give you a variety of views, such as those cherry trees on the UW quad from high above, or salmon beneath the stream, or in the case of this year's pictures, we had mermaids in a pool. <laughs> there is so much heart and soul that our visual journalists invest in documenting the diversity of the Pacific Northwest. Through dedicated prep work involving research, light, timing, and many other details, as well as the ability to transcend any number of challenges in the moment, our photographers work tirelessly to bring you a strong visual report every single day. Beyond their efforts, our photo editors and photo production staff hold it all together behind the scenes. Sometimes they're the unsung heroes, so I want to be sure to acknowledge them tonight, too. This evening, you'll get to hear from Kevin Clark, the most recent addition to our photographer team, as well as Jennifer Buchanan. We'll also be giving away a couple of framed prints, and we'll have a drawing for those at the end of the show after our question and answer session. I want to thank you all again for coming, 
and for supporting local journalism. It's great to have you here. Now let's look at some awesome photos. These are our pictures of the year. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Jennifer Buchanan. Jennifer is a joy to work with and an amazing photographer. I know you'll enjoy her presentation. Hi everyone, uh, it's nice to see so many of you here. So, so many of you, not intimidating at all. <laughs> <laughs> News photographers are good at being wallflowers. Uh, the less you notice us, the better. So it probably shouldn't come as a huge surprise that some of us aren't very good at public speaking now that we've lowered your expectations. Uh, a little background on me, I started at the, t at the Times about two and a half years ago, after a decade at the Everett Herald and seven years photo editing for MSN, Bing, and the Seahawks. People have asked me ever since I got this job how I like it. My answer is this, this is my dream job. Every day is a new challenge, a new assignment, a new fun thing to do. I feel incredibly lucky to have been plucked out of an enormous applicant pool and asked to shoot photos that help tell the story of our region for a living. I have wonderful coworkers who every day challenge me with their own work to be better. Special shout out to Dean Rutz, <laughs> who along being with my shooting partner for all the big sporting events, loves to explore and eat his way through away cities as much as I do. Dino, I think we ate too much brisket in Texas, but I have no regrets. My editors are superb and always work so hard to make our jobs as easy as they can be. I am beyond honored to work with everyone at the Times. And this is not my first stint here. I was a tech in the photo department when I was in college, doing some photo production work and maintaining the film processors. Yes, I'm that old. I'm a native Seattleite and a good Northwesterner. I love being outside in the mountains. I love skiing, biking, running, gardening, and fishing with my dad. Oh, and I love dogs because, hello, dogs. Yeah. 
I believe most of you know me as a sports photographer, and it's true. I would say the majority of my work here is sports, but that doesn't mean one of the most fun things about this job is the variety. It's not just sports, it's not just news, it's not just features, it's everything. Any given day, you can find me shivering, knee deep in seawater, having just discovered a hole in my waders, but nevertheless, photographing opening, razor, opening day of razor clam season on the coast. I got lucky with the light that day. Not often do you see that kind of quality in January. The next day, it's off to Eastern Washington in the dead of winter to watch a bobcat racing away from a trap after being released by researchers. Starting before 7 a.m. on a frigid morning, we rode snowmobiles deep into the mountains with lynx researchers. Over a course of a day on snow, we ran a trap line of 37 live traps. No lynx that day, unfortunately, but there was a lonely bobcat who was pretty pumped to be released from his trap. This assignment was a great example of how we dedicate precious time and money to important and often overlooked stories. And in my book, any day outside is a good day, even if that day is super duper cold. Relief, happiness, honor, all of these emotions and more were written on the faces of this crew that had paddled over 1,500 miles in 19 days to arrive on the sandy expanses of Alki Beach after canoe journey. I had never seen as many evidence markers than what I saw at the shooting at Rainier Beach Safeway. For the record, they went up to 94. A lone police officer surrounded by a crush of yellow tags. Gun violence continues to ravage our communities with shootings at schools, rec centers, street corners, and yes, even grocery stores. Ah. The Macklemore photo. This is a lucky photo and one that I almost didn't take. Back in March, we learned day of that Macklemore would be performing a free show that evening at Numos on Capitol Hill. A few days before, the Seattle rapper had caused a bit of a stir when he released his worldwide tour schedule and the Emerald City was notably not on it. I've often heard that Numos is a great place to see a show, but what I'm guessing fans like about it is what makes it challenging to photograph in. There are no photo positions, no pit, no mixing board to stand in front of. It's just you and 700 very hot, very sweaty fans inches from the artist. I had debated about staying for the full show. I knew I had to upload, those, upload photos that evening for the online gallery. Should I bounce after a few songs? Or should I stay to see if Macklemore did something awesome for his hometown crowd? I opted for the latter and was sure glad that I did. After the very last song of the encore, Mac went crowd surfing. Not so much surfing as it was walking. He stepped off the stage onto the waiting arms of his most devoted fans. And for a split second, their, their hands were backlit by the house lights, dozens of people reaching up to hold up their hero. It's one of those photos that when you're taking it, you have the possibility, you, you know that it has the possibility to be good. But this one is particularly lucky. I was exposed for the stage lights. When Macklemore left the stage, I compensated by reducing my shutter speed on the fly. What had been 1 800th of a second on stage quickly became 1 125th as I spun my dials down as fast as I could. How on earth he and the fans are as sharp as they are will remain a mystery to me. It was luck. You've got to love super fun portrait subjects. This is Bernie Griffin, former managing director of the Fifth Avenue Theater. She was retiring after more than two decades at the helm of the musical producing theater. I only knew her for two hours, but by the time I was done photographing her, I felt like family. Okay, now for the Blue Angels photo. Everyone wants to talk about this one, and rightfully so. I think it's pretty awesome and was happy to have gotten it, although plain enthusiasts will tell you that this is not a unique photo. <laughs> this photo is a physics lesson. Most of all, okay, I know you're all glazing over, but hear me out. <laughs> After conferring with people much smarter than I, here's the best I can do in explaining what is happening. The cloud forming near the back of this FA-18 Super Hornet is called a vapor cone. It is a visual representation of the sound barrier. The aircraft is exhibiting transonic flight in which the air at the front of the aircraft is supersonic, above the speed of sound, and the air at the back is subsonic, below the speed of sound. Had the pilot increased his speed, the cone would have slipped off the back of the aircraft, hit the vacuum that had formed there, and a sonic boom would have occurred, likely shattering quite a few windows on Mercer Island. 
The relative high humidity of this August day contributed greatly to the cloud formation. I love it when I can slip some science into photography. My editor, Bettina Hansen, had tasked me with making a photo for daylight savings and had the idea to photograph the King Street Station clock tower. I took my bodyguard, husband Joe, with me down to Pioneer Square that night. We spent the first hour or so doing long exposure airplane trails, and I was quite happy with some of those. Then an almost full moon began to peek out over the horizon. An in-camera double exposure was needed to get the exposure correct for both the clock face and the moon. For reference, the moon was about five stops brighter than the clock. I like repeating themes in my photographs. How about circularly, how about circular onions delicately placed on top of a bed of circularly arranged steak in a circular bowl. <laughs> Summer means the Long Acres Mile at Emerald Downs. And if only someone would tell them to run the mile even just 30 minutes before its normal start time, we could see amazing light like this. As it turns out, the sun sets behind the grandstands sometime between the end of this, the Washington Oaks race, and the post for the mile. This photo was taken by a remote camera placed underneath the rail, pre-focused at 17 millimeters and shot at f16. The high f-stop means that the iris that controls how much light comes into the camera is very small, causing the sunburst effect. Remote cameras can come in quite handy for events that happen very quickly, like a horse race. And in horse racing, you, as a human being with a camera, can't just hide under the rail and shoot photos. Horses are above all fright animals and will shy or startle. The last thing I would want is a horse to throw its rider because they saw a human laying under the rail. In the fall of 2022, I was entrusted with an amazing opportunity. Boeing had invited the Seattle Times into the wide body facility in Everett to document the manufacturing of the very last 747. We in the New York Times were the only two outlets afforded this opportunity. Due to a Boeing imposed embargo, these images were not allowed to be published until the weekend before the delivery, which was February 2023. Over the course of late nights and long days, I was able to witness the construction of the very last queen of the skies. This is a time lapse of the final body join, which takes place during the overnight Boeing shift. It takes about six hours for it to all come together. I got home around 3 a.m. During the final body join, the nose and aft sections of the aircraft are craned in and attached to the wing box section. 747 engines are huge. They weigh over 14,000 pounds apiece, and there are, of course, four of them. It's not every day you can fly a giant tail cone, which contains the auxiliary power unit like a kite. People built these incredible machines not just with cranes, but with their hands. And spectators, dwarfed by the sheer size of the queen, wave as the distinctive hump emerges from the assembly hangar for the last time. The sun sets on the final 747 as it comes in for a landing at Payne Field during a test flight, Mount Rainier resplendent in the background. So I'm sure most of you know my byline and don't often associate it with photos outside of the sports section. So I know what you're here for. It's the sports photos. We're going there now. May all of you experience the same amount of joy as a high school football team winning the state championship. Or rookie Jake Bobo scoring a touchdown in the good light and the best uniforms. I wish they would wear these all the time. When the Seahawks traveled east to the Meadowlands for a Monday night clash with the Giants, no one knew that they would tie the team record for sacks in the game with 11. Here Bobby Wagner appears to smile as he wraps Giants quarterback Daniel Jones in a huge hug. <laughs> At the end of the game, the discussion with my editor wasn't if we should use a sack photo for the sports cover, but rather which of the 11 sack photos we should use. A brilliant headline by assistant sports editor Kelly Ward highlighted the cover the next day. It's a good cover. Who doesn't love a mirror image? <laughs> and sometimes, after shooting player introductions for the thousandth time, you make a nice frame, which is, of course, why you shoot the same things over and over for that one time. And other times, as luck would have it, the winning touchdown comes directly at you. 
the ball just at Jackson Smith and the Jigba's fingertips, his legs in lockstep with the Philadelphia corner who will never catch up. And Coach Pete was always fun to watch and always fun to shoot. Infectious energy that coaches half his age don't have. Seattle will miss him. We are so lucky to have such a photogenic, charismatic player like Julio Rodriguez. Every game there is the potential to witness something new and unique involving him. He plays the game with such passion and joy. He's also easy on the eyes. <laughs> Gino Suarez in his noodle bat. In reality, a broken bat in process. During Felix Hernandez Mariners Hall of Fame induction, Ken Griffey Jr., always the jokester, lined up a photo. It's not every day a kid can take a selfie with the king. <laughs> the All-Star Game was in Seattle this year, and I, for one, will be happy to never, ever cover one ever again. <laughs> Normally, easy tasks became monumentally hard. Lots of things that week went sideways, and this photo is a perfect example. During the Major League Baseball draft, this was my assigned photo position, a teleprompter directly blocking the face of the commissioner, fans just waiting to jump up out of their chairs and block an already flawed frame. So Major League Baseball threw a crate of lemons at you, make funny lemonade. I actually broke free of my assigned position for the majority of the draft and photographed it from closer to the stage where I wouldn't be blocked. Sometimes what we photographers hate about outfield advertisements, bright, eye-catching colors, makes for a bright, eye-catching, graphically pleasing photo. This photo was shot from center field. Big events like the All-Star Game often have space limitations on normal shooting positions. We put Dean Rutz in the first base photo well and Kevin Clark in third. I chose center field if only to see something different, and I got it. The new swiveling view screen on my cameras allows me to put one directly on the court or the ground. In, in this case, merging a basketball player with her reflection during a Sweet 16 game at Climate Pledge. The UW women's softball team was down six to nothing, entering the seventh and final inning of their game against McNeese. There were three outs left in their season if they did not score six runs. Teams in the history of the NCAA tournament in that situation were five and 903. So what did they do? They made that six and 903, scoring seven runs and walking off with the most dramatic win I have ever seen. I love all the faces in this photo, the players surrounding their coach. Normal, normally a celebration photo has quite a few backs and not as many happy faces. Seattle and soccer said goodbye to Megan Rapino this season. In her farewell game, a record women's sporting event crowd packed the stands to see her play. I grew up playing soccer. It was my sport. When Brandi Chastain ripped off her jersey after slamming home the winning penalty kick to win the 1999 World Cup, I was amazed, elated, proud, and above all, empowered. She had done for women's sports what no one had done before her. Enter Megan Rapino. She is the star of a new generation of women's state, United States soccer players, men or women. It is not a stretch to say what she has done off the pitch for the advancement of women's sports and social justice is greater than what she has done on it. But Rapino's fairy tale exit was not to be, as she blew out her Achilles three minutes into the championship game in San Diego. The rain would lose to Gotham two to one. I was dehydrated and my head was pounding from the altitude in Denver when the Seattle Kraken defeated the Stanley Cup champions, the Colorado Avalanche, in the first round of the playoffs. The Kraken players came pouring off the bench as the horn sounded on game seven, the coaches embracing in the background. The NHL playoffs are insane. There's nothing quite like playoff hockey. If a regular season overtime game goes to 10, the intensity and physicality of the playoffs go to 11. Spinal tap, anyone? Okay, good. In the second round, the Kraken faced a Dallas team that looked beatable most games, but ultimately, they lost in seven. How do you illustrate a team leaving a conference? Enter the dog walk. Before every home game, the UW football players walk arm in arm across the field. I could not, I could not have asked for a better weather game to shoot this photo. The long line of players and their shadows crossing over the Pac-12 logo as they literally and symbolically walk away. 
In what was a preview of the Huskies joining the Big Ten, the Dogs traveled to East Lansing to take on Michigan State. The Husky offense made, hi made highlight reel catches, and I made the mistake of eating a concession stand hot dog, perils of the media mill, and it was not a highlight. <laughs> a storm was building over Montlake as the Huskies opened the very last Pac-12 season. Rain sometimes makes everything more magical, even a drop back. I love it when people in my photographs aren't touching the ground. <laughs> the Apple Cup this year was decided by a last second field goal by a walk-on kicker, who subsequently was put on scholarship in the locker room directly after the win. <laughs> Kalen DeBoer was all smiles after the game as he walked off the field, Apple Cup trophy behind him. Who knew other than maybe the athletic director and DeBoer himself that it would be the last time we would see him at Husky Stadium. So the next photos are technically from this year, but they finish out the 2023 season, so I, I hope you'll forgive me. Washington advanced through the Pac-12 title game with yet another win over Oregon, always a good feeling to be Oregon, and drew, a tech, and drew Texas for a New Year's Day clash in the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans. I do love weird photos. Roma Dunze is some sort of magician catching that ball with his knuckles. The joy of a turnover. And the SWAT, securing the Huskies' win. The dogs celebrated on the field as Dean and I ran to and from the photo room in shifts to get our photos out for our print editions. And when I say ran, I mean we sprinted. After the celebration began to die down, I ran as fast as I could to the photo room to transmit the last play. Dean shot the trophy hoisting and also ran in. I ran back out to photograph the Huskies leaving the field and then you guessed it, sprinted back into the photo room. It was a race, literally, against time as deadlines loomed left and right. But we made it and had celebratory beignets at 2 a.m. For a really good look into what happened in the office that night, I highly recommend reading our executive editor's piece. You can go to our website and search Sugar Bowl and Squeaker. <laughs> Next up, the college football championship game. Fortified by Pi and Baton Rouge, there's a theme here, it's food for photographers. Fellow photographer Dean Rutz and I road tripped the five and a half hours from New Orleans to Houston through the bayou and oil refineries. The dogs were all smiles as they were introduced to the crowd. But it quickly became clear that the normal Huskies I had seen all year long weren't here. Odunze made drops on balls that he caught earlier in the season. He and quarterback Michael Penix, normally completely in sync, were not on the same page. And the Huskies couldn't get their ground game going, Dylan Johnson having been injured late in the Sugar Bowl against Texas. Penix got hammered by the Michigan defense, coming up injured on this play in the fourth quarter. It was hard to watch him yell out in pain after every snap. UW walked off the field in a hail of Michigan-colored confetti. And because we don't want to end on such a sad note, here is the crew for the national championship game. Card runners Robert and Nathan on the outsides, and Dean and myself. And that was my 2023. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>
And honestly, I love this photo just because of the majesty of the forest and just the concern of these two activists about Washington State selling rights to log this land. It was an interesting story and it was a privilege to photograph this. Now, <laughs> word about climate and camera gear. And always you have to pay attention. If you look above Steven's hat, you'll see how the sky's a little bit fuzzy. That's rain on my lens. When I was shooting this, I didn't even know it. I didn't even pay attention. Didn't even cross my mind until I got back and was editing photos and saw a series of blurry images, sometime on the face, sometime here, and I didn't know what it was. And I went to my bag, picked up my camera, and my lens is just full of water. <laughs> like, oh. But this came out, and I really enjoy it. Uh, also, I enjoy it because it is a almost a direct replica of a photo I took with my daughter when I took her on an assignment into the deep woods, and she stood similar to Joshua just looking up at the majesty of the trees. Now, this is one of my photos that I got a lot of comments on. This day, I called in sick to work. I was had a cold. I'm pretty sure like many of you have had already or just coming off of. And I told Bettina at the desk, I can't make it into work. I'm feeling awful. So I'm at home, and I hear, Woo! OK. A common occurrence, not too big a deal. Okay, that's two. Uh, maybe I'll keep an eye out. Three times more, and I was like, check the app for that. There's an app for that, by the way. <laughs> and sure enough, there's a fire on Lake City Way. I, and I go down, I was like, okay, I call the desk, I go, hey, I know I'm sick, but there's a, a, a multiple alarm fire, multiple engines have rolled, I'm gonna go check it out. They said, cool, no problem. I go down the hill. And I park and I start walking and when I'm coming around the corner, I see trails of water, streams of water, honestly, and people escorting dogs by the collars across the street to another property. And I keep walking and I come up on this scene. People are scrambling. First, the first responders are getting in the building, coming out of the building, chopping holes in the roof. And I see this, these first responders working on this husky. When I rolled up, the husky's eyes were not closed, and they continued to work on this dog for five to 10 minutes. And the husky's eyes opened. And then this, <laughs> his friend came over and said, are you all right? <laughs> and it's one of my favorite images. Life is in the details. This is just normal assignment about an initiative uh, when our special elections. Uh, my assignment that day was to go out with some canvassers and some grassroots activists as they went and knocked on doors. Some people answered, some people said go away, some people just didn't want to have anything to do with them. Some, one lady opened her door in a bathrobe and said, sure, you can take my photo. It was awesome. <laughs> Um, but I really love this photo, just, well, sorry, pardon my pun, it, it, just because of life is in the details. This is a replica of a photo of, if you know anything about uh, Dennis Rodman uh, when he was playing in the NBA, one of the most prolific rebounders in the NBA, and there's a photo of him that we have, there's a small little business card that we have in our house, someone used that photo for it. And it Dennis Rodman is literally going horizontal on a basketball court. Um, everybody knows that basketball is a vertical sport, right? <laughs> so I love this photo just for the fact that she's going horizontal and it reminds me of that photo that I see. And you can see the, the urgency of the coach in the background and just, just the pure action of it. And if you've never been to the Hardwood Classic in Tacoma for high school basketball state, Playoffs. It is an experience. I, I suggest everybody do it at least once, a, at least once in a lifetime. Remember, I said fires on Lake City. Well, in the first, I will say, six months of working at Seattle Times, I've covered three fires on Lake City alone, and then another fire less than two miles from my house. So I've covered more fires for the Seattle Times <laughs> in that short period short attention, a short span of time than I have in the entire eight years when I was at the Everett Herald. This is one of those occasions where, woo, well, let's see, woo, woo. Okay, let me, let me check the app. And sure enough, a multiple alarm fire. Meet Aaron Clark. Uh, he was a volunteer for military service in Ukraine. Um, we did a profile on him, and uh, he told us his story. It was a poignant story. He shared some of the details that I won't go into, but hey, you can definitely check it out on seattletimes.com. 
it was tragic in a way that he, he's dealing with personal issues. He lost some friends. Some of his friends didn't come back whole. And he personally is dealing with a number of uh, mental, mental issues just from the conflict himself. And this is a series, this came out in a series where he was the nicest guy. He was willing to do anything. You bring your, your uniform with it, shoot it. You got your backpack, shoot it. Hey, they gave me a medal, got a patch. We got all those photos. And this photo was taken in front of a strip mall wall in Beacon Hill. So photos can be taken anywhere. If you find a nice, light, clean background, you can do it. And this is one of my favorite photos. And it just turned out really well. Meet Ellen Echohawk, uh, CEO of 8th Generation. Now, this is my favorite photo of Ellen, but this isn't the one that ran in the paper. The one that ran in the paper was a little bit more serious. I, I, you have to excuse me. I say ran in the paper because I like the paper. I also read online, but when I say paper, it's because I just like the paper. Hey, they spend money to publish that, my work in the paper. I think it's important. <laughs> well, in the background, in the mural, there is a uh, painting of a orca. And I told Colleen, said, hey, I was on YouTube and I watched this guy talking about orcas and he called them the psychopathic sea pandas. And she, <laughs> and she busted up laughing. And that's the frame. And she said, it's so true. And that's the face you have there. <laughs> Did anybody know we have the, one of the, the largest Shinto shrines in North America here in Washington State? in Granite Falls, of all places. No, I didn't know that either, not until I came to the Seattle Times. Um, meet Lawrence, he's a Shinto priest. Really nice guy, introspective person, and we toured the grounds, got really nice photos, and I have a photo of him with his hand on a statue of a frog, which is a sign of good luck in our culture. And after a while of walking around, taking photos of him, he said, I'm done. <laughs> okay. He pulled a complete diva move. It was great. It was great. From an introspective guy, he just says, I'm done. And that moment there, that moment of I'm done was great. It says so much about him. You can see the character of him, just the age, and the, his, I would say the, the wisdom in his face, I, I guess you'd say. And I love just the moment of it and his, the expression on his face. Uh, opening day at Mariners. Um, I always wanted to get this photo. Um, before, I never actually had the opportunity because I was actually many times the lone photographer on these events. So when I had the opportunity to shoot this photo, I jumped at it. And I, just, I said, I'm bringing my wide angle lens because I wanted to get this photo because I rarely get a chance to do it. And on opening day, we ran the stories. And this photo, this photo didn't show up anywhere. It wasn't online, wasn't in paper. But months later, before the All-Star game, it actually showed up in print. And I was like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this. <laughs> this is an interesting story. Please, 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 if you have a moment, it's called the Tulip Wars, or what I call the Tulip Wars. Uh, it's a story about uh, one of the biggest and largest tulip uh, agricultural sites, agritourism sites in Skagit Valley, Skagit County. And four people bought it. One of the partners sold out, and he went down the street about a mile and a half and opened up his own, his own, um, agritourism agri site of tulips. And so down this is legal battle of what's going on here, content, all that kind of stuff. Well, so we tour both sites, and I've got pictures of tulips. And I have more pictures of tulips. And I have pictures of people walking by tulips. I have, people, I have pictures of people taking pictures of tulips. And I have drone photos of tulips. So as I'm leaving, it's getting late, and I was like, OK, well, let's see what else I can do. Now, when I was in high school, I took my only photography class. One of the assignments was to uh, look for something that, says, that signifies uh, repetition and variation. And so when I go out on assignment, I'm always looking for that, repetition and variation in my assignments, in my photos. And I was like, oh, those trees are nice. That's pretty good. I wish they were in bloom, but hey, what can you do? And then I started working in like the trees, had lined it up, and then let me bend down here just a little, a little bit, a little bit. Oh, what do we have here? All right, let's see. 
as I'm taking this frame, people are walking through, and it slowly starts to come together. And I was like, oh, this is great. Let me wait and see what happens. I'm 6'5 and waiting, and <laughs> I'm stalking people <laughs> as they're walking through enjoying their tulips. But this worked. It came out where just right where they lined up in between the trees, and I think it worked. Now, in a perfect world, there would have been a stroller in one section, <laughs> a kid with a red balloon in the next, <laughs> and a rainbow. <laughs> the women's rowing team at the University of Washington, and it was a joy to be out on the water. Um, by the way, I didn't say this earlier during the uh, <laughs> during our rehearsals, but the coach, when she wants to say yay or go man, she goes woman really loud, like to, <laughs> to tell the ladies they're doing a good job. And I had to ask her, what are you saying? She says, I'm saying woman. Like you said, man, she says woman. She screams it out really loud. And I just thought that was wonderful. Well, coming to Seattle in uh, 1991 with the Great Migration, the, the boats, the ships on the ship canal are just ubiquitous. You really don't think about them unless you're in that world of how actually massive these machines are. And as we're going through, it struck me as we're in this little bitty dinghy following these, <laughs> these shells going through the ship canal, and you're, <laughs> they're this big, and these boats are this big. <laughs> and just the, the repetition and variation of it, and man and machine, and just the hard work that goes into it. It makes me one of my favorite photos. This is David Easterly. He's a 25-year veteran of the King County Sheriff's Office. He was uh, shot on, uh, on, in duty, and, on duty, and his partner saved his life, uh, provided critical first aid that actually saved his life. Not a Band-Aid, I mean, honest to goodness, saved his life. If he hadn't done what he had done that day, he, David wouldn't have been with us. Um, so first responders, firefighters, everyone, they came out and they lined the hall underneath Ninth Avenue. If anybody doesn't know, Harborview is on one side of Ninth, and then there's a medical building on the other side. To get through the nursing, the medical staff, they have a hallway underneath that they travel. It's small, it's tiny, and it's hot. So First responders line the hall to give him a salute as he's going home for the first time in months. This is the last playoff game here at, I almost said Key Arena because when I was here, anyway, we won't get into that. <laughs> at Climate Pledge, uh, I was the second shooter along with Dean. Dino! And if you can look to your right of the photo underneath the, one of those lights, Dean is in there on the rink level. You can, you can see him. Hi, Dean. Anyway, I was sitting mid-rink at the, I think, a second level of concourse, and it just happened this way. I got there early and set my stool right there on mid-ice and to take this photo. I didn't know this was going to happen. This is one of those moments where you're like, oh, wow, that worked out. <laughs> Seattle Storm's Jewel Lloyd. Now, this is media day. So I get there early. I get there 30 minutes early to set up my lights, my backdrop test, and I have lots of selfies of me trying to figure out what light is working, which one is not. And I brought four. One of them didn't work, so I had to put that away. And Lloyd was still an hour late to it. So I'm sitting there playing music on my iPhone as I'm waiting. And she shows up, nice as can be. And I say, oh, did you bring a ball? She says, I don't want to take a picture of the ball. OK. Every idea I had that day just went out the window. <laughs> so, because when you have a preconceived notion in your head, it is very hard to get it out of there, especially if it's something you want to do in this situation. So I said, okay, so what do I do? I start posing with her. And these are the series of photos that we did. Hey, do this. Hey, what about this? How about that? How about this? How about that? <laughs> How about this one? I had to, she was like, what? You want me to pray? No, 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 I want you to like, do this. <laughs> and this one, which did not run in the paper, one of the other ones ran as the cover. This one didn't make it, but this is my favorite one. Look at that smile. 
Honestly, it's great. I love the smile. She's got some biceps, some guns on her, right? Those are nice. And my favorite part of it is the eye smile. I love eye smiles, and I really love it. So she was great. Um, salad roll by Taiku in Seattle. I love taking pictures of food because food can't talk back. <laughs> Um, and it's a great chance to experiment. Hey, what if I put my light here? 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 I can do anything with it, and it won't say a word. It's awesome. And this was taken in our classic Seattle days. It was raining. If, you, if I pull back a little bit, this is the metal table outside. You'll see raindrops all over it. And um, this, it, I pushed the table against the wall where they had a series of bamboo um, plantings. And this is the image I got, and I really liked it. Again, Jewel Lloyd, it's just exciting. And I like faces. If I can get a face over a landscape, I would go for a face any day. And I, and I really gravitate toward um, faces and characters of people. Speaking of faces, again, uh, this is Jackie Hollinsworth Robbins and Char Char Charmaine uh, Sly. And they're celebrating the Tuesday election results at Joy Hollinsworth election party, um, results party. And again, just the, just the joy of it is what appeals to me, and I just loved it. Yeah, I can't remember her name. <laughs> um, you'll see some of this later, but this is following an interview by uh, Lauren that we did. Um, I, before I showed up, I asked for a ball in her jersey to be brought as props for a photo. So I, we got there early, and I set up lights on. There's an indoor soccer field. I set up lights and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't, and I brought, for some reason, I left the light up in the interview area. And I come back from setting up, and Lauren has taken one of my lights. And she put it on the jersey itself. And you, if you go to seattletimes.com, you can actually see the video. And you'll see this jersey in the background with a little spotlight on it. That's my light, by the way. <laughs> and as we're leaving, as the interview is over, and we're leaving, and I have very few minutes with her. She's sat down for an hour-long video, and I think I have two minutes. No, sorry. More like 10 minutes with her to get this photo. I said, hey, can you... Can you put your back against this wall right quick? I grab my light and move it a little bit. Then, actually, then I grabbed one of Lauren's lights and I moved it over there. So you can see Lauren's light on the right and mine on the left. And Megan, being the consummate professional she was, she just worked it. She did it. I mean, she did the whole runway model. It was awesome. And uh, this was the better photo. There was the other one. It came out OK. This is, but this is the one they used. And uh, this one is actually the commemorative poster that uh, was published for her re uh, retirement announcement. The Boys of Summer. The Trident, I think, is wonderful. I really do, and I really enjoy it. When they lose, I don't care. When they hit a home run, it is awesome. I've seen some great photos that come out of when they just celebrate a home run in the dugout. Everybody's happy for that player. And this is one of them, uh, J.P. Uh, Crawford, which he's one of, probably one of my favorite baseball players. He's really excited. And just the joy of everybody celebrating with him is just touching. Gulgan. OK, this is exciting. OK, this is the CEO of the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. And their offices in King, uh, King Street Station. And as we're taking pictures in the gallery space, brand new, and she's very proud of it, in the gallery space, she says, hey, you want to go up to the top of the clock tower? And I go, sure. I can't, I can't request that because I don't want to be liable and all that legal stuff. But if she says, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so comes to find out, the door is in their bathroom. So we hike up these, these, gal these galley steps, and then we go through. And it's, if anybody remember that old video game, Donkey Kong, where you go over and up, <laughs> over and up, six times we did that. And as I'm walking, I was like, this is going to be cool. I love my job. I love my job. I love my job. So we're walking. And this is an experience like, has anybody ever been to the top of the clock tower? There's one. <laughs> so we get up there, and, we, and it is amazing. And it's four faces of the clock, and it's great. And then, 
to top it off, there's these spiral staircases that you can go up. And then if you walk a little bit further, you see this little Hogwarts door. You open it up, and you're outside on the rail of the peak. Did I tell you I love my job? It was awesome. You can't. This is great. And this is the photo I got on the spiral staircase. I said, go, get, come on over here. And she was so wonderful. Landscape. <laughs> This is after the big national game, college game day. Um, Michael Penix, when, he def when they defeated Oregon. Yay. I'm a Husky, so this was pretty good for me, too. Um, this was following when Oregon was leaving after they lost. Michael, this, not many people know this. You know how quarterbacks at the end of the game, if you ever watch football, they meet in the middle of the field? Well, the Oregon quarterback did not do that. He went straight to the locker room. Michael came from the other side of the field, and he beelined to the quarterback to do the traditional thing. So it was wonderful. And then making his way back, it was crowded and everything. And I got this picture. Yes, I know you can't see his face, but I think the emotion and the urgency of people around him, I think, makes that image. Meet Benton. Now, I know this isn't. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> this is one of my favorite photos. It says a lot by saying a little. I love the juxtaposition of this image. What do you mean by that? I mean, look at the joy on Benton's face. This is a child who has just discovered how to laugh. He has a number of disabilities and challenges ahead of him and his family. And this is a therapy swing that they've installed in their house. And he has their physical therapists that come to his house at least three times a week. And they put him in his swing, and he just laughs and giggles, which is apparently really new to the mom. And I just love his face, his baby smooth skin. But helping him out is a strength in the age of the older generation to help him succeed. And I just love the quality of that image. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to, you know. If it doesn't pull on your heartstrings, that's you, but I like this photo. <laughs> Can I get a holler for Pete? <laughs> I've shot a lot of coaches. I'm sorry. I've photographed a lot of coaches, and I've never seen anyone so excitable on the sideline as Pete Carroll, and he will be missed. Uh, this is a bookstore opening in Fremont. And you get your standard people looking at books, people browsing books, people buying books, you get some colorful books, book details. But off in the corner in the children's area, this young lady's just sitting there reading, and her partner comes over, drapes over her shoulder, and she reads next over top of her. And I must, I just quietly, with my camera, took these images. And I just, afterward, I just walked up. I said, wow, that's great. And I introduced myself, and I said, this is, I just love this photo. Can I get your name? And they're like, sure. And apparently, this is very poignant to her. Um, she's of the nah, LGBT community. And it was a book explaining uh, of, that she read, or it was, she was reflecting on her experience as a child. And she was crying. So. Tina Langley. Like, again, I love faces. I love body language. And, I found myself just not photographing the action on the court, just tracking Tina, because she was always going to give me something. And she's like, I don't know. For a coach, it's great. I love it. Quiet moments at a rally. Um, this is one of my favorite. And again, going back to my photography classes, you always look for leading lines and things that lead you into images. And uh, nice, quiet photo. And I love it. I, it's just quiet. And it, I like quiet things. Speaking of quiet things, <laughs> my job was to take a photo of 28 bottles of Costco wine. <laughs> and individually. So I have all these bottles of wine and not a sip to drink. Thank you. So what do I do? Well, let's see. How do I make this look somewhat appealing? Oh, we have these boards. Let's see what this. And this came out. I really like this photo. It has a lot of textures, the colors, and everything like that, and the lighting is great. Um, I, I see all my mistakes, but overall, I'm kind of happy with it. And again, uh, 
Tan, our, one of our food writers, he got to taste test every last one of these. It's actually now a holiday section of the Seattle Times, and you could, you could track it down. And I didn't get a sip. <laughs> my wife went out and bought a couple, though. This is one of my favorite assignments. This is the silent book club readings uh, from West Seattle. It's a growing trend across the country. People get together, and at 7.30, on the dot, all noise stops and you read for an hour surrounded by your fellow readers. And at 8.30, you pull out your beer, your wine, and you start talking about whatever you want. And it's great, it was awesome. And at the end, they gather all the books that people are reading and post to the social media. And this is, this is when they gather the books. And again, faces, emotions, and I love it. And as an introvert, I walked into this assignment going, yay! <laughs> again, uh, variation and repetition, I know, I know, it's an old thing, but hey, it's me, I like it. Quiet moment, uh, a visual for the, deaths, the homeless deaths in Seattle, in King County. And I like to close with Pete and our local star, Beast Mode. He smiles more now <laughs> than he ever did as a player. I guess that's what retirement does, and I, at least I hope it does. I hope you smile more in your retirement. I, know, I hope I will, too. I like to close by saying I love my job. I really do. It's the only job where one day you can be taking pictures of a sugar beet farmer in eastern Washington, and the next day you'll be standing 10 feet from King Griffey Jr. in the King Dome. I actually did that when I was, as an intern at Seattle Times. I photographed a homeless Elvis impersonator one day, and I photographed the President of the United States the next. And I've done everything in between. I love my job. Next up, I'm going to bring up Lauren Frone, one of my two favorite people at the Seattle Times. Why? I love shooting video. Love it. I, I want to be Steven Spielberg. I hate editing video. <laughs> Guess whose job is it to edit video? Hey, Lauren, come on up. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm just going to speak very briefly. Uh, I'm Lauren Frone, lead video journalist at the Seattle Times, and I've been on staff here for going on 10 years. Um, each year, our small video team produces dozens of video stories. Videos in a newspaper, you might be wondering. Yes, for more than 15 years, the Seattle Times has produced informative, engaging video stories, visual projects, and short documentaries that feature characters, issues, and slices of life from our many diverse communities in Seattle and throughout the Pacific Northwest. We publish them along with our print stories on seattletimes.com. Uh, my colleague, Ramon Dampour, who's in the audience over there, wave Ramon, hi. Um, he and I film and edit the majority of the video stories these days with major contributions from staff photographer Erica Schultz, and every photojournalist contributes to our video work, whether it's short complimentary feature clips, drone footage, or breaking news coverage shot on iPhones, and everything in between. And I think I can speak for both Ramon and myself in saying that collaborating in the field with our photographer colleagues is a highlight of the job, and not just because we can steal each other's lights, Kevin. <laughs> um, very shortly, we're going to have time for a question and answer session with our staff. Uh, but first, I've edited a brief compilation of our video work showcasing some of the topics and themes we tackled throughout 2023. We dove into issues about land use, dams, and native sovereignty. We've interviewed sports stars. We rode in a vintage hydro and immersed in Seattle's cat culture. <laughs> we also spent a lot of time on boats and standing in water, apparently, according to these photos. Um, and we also produced stories about difficult topics like youth mental health, segregation, injustice, with community members letting us into their lives and telling their own stories in their own words. If it leaves you wanting to watch more, you can visit seattletimes.com slash video to see all of our video stories. So now I present the year in video for 2023. Thank you.
We have a saying, Hishuk is Tzawak. Everything is connected. Our spirituality, our way of life, and who we are depends on the health of the Klamath Basin. We know that the river can repair itself with the removal of the dam. Eventually, the Lord calls all the dams home. When I thought about my daughter being trans, I was scared at first, and I thought about how hard it is to be a trans person in the world, especially now. Before I could worry for her, I saw her open up and just kind of explode with so much like personality and energy. It's fun. It's unlike anything you've ever done. It's awesome. Pinnipeds are top predators, and we do know that they eat a lot of salmon. You know, are, are they part of the problem? Mount Baker is a very magical place. It's a very special place. We were the first to have to welcome snowboarding. It was like where it became an, an option in the mountains. A lot of people are starting to realize like accessibility and just inclusion. We all belong here. With a cat, you have to kind of be on even playing ground. You're doing what he wants. It's more of a partnership. This cat is going to be a holdable cat. This made me realize how crazy we are as cat people. Like, we're going to the cat convention, like how obsessed we are. That is the Cat Luminati agenda, by the way. Cats are going to be the number one pet globally one day. We are going to talk to some all-stars. I'm not sure we're going to get to Shohei Otani. We'll never know if he thinks cream cheese twongs on a hot dog or not. I know what it feels like to be in pain emotionally during birth, emotionally after birth. As a community doula, I'm just there for people within my community so they don't have to birth alone. I don't think it was even possible at the point when I was a kid to even dream of what was to come. Playing on the biggest stage, being able to play all over the world, it has been a dream for sure. They don't know what to do with black students. I had done everything I was supposed to do and it wasn't good enough. Integration has obviously given me some opportunities, but it has also made really clear to me that some of those opportunities I had to take, some of them I had to find, some of them I had to journey through. I haven't really recovered like I'm in a nightmare. Why isn't there any justice for me? The thing about Northern State is it's a complicated place. A lot of the history of Northern State was lost right down to the people. How many of them are like Lillian that are just gone? She's in there. She's in there somewhere. I just gotta find her. She had nobody to speak for her. She had no voice. She had no rights. And she was real. Every cedar tree is very important to the Native American population because they help root us to who we are. Our people were the first stewards of this land. You know, we knew what we could do and we knew what we couldn't do. Their culture and our culture are very similar. They really deeply, deeply care about taking care of our planet which closely exactly aligns with the tribal values that we have. How important it is that we don't empty our world from resources and then use those resources to drown our world with trash. We're all doing this for somebody else's future. It's not about us. We need change and, and we need solutions. We have to stop leaving scars behind. No, that takes so long to heal. The question is, of all the moments that you covered this year, are there any that you put your camera down and decided not to cover, or any that you 
or kicking yourself because you missed it? I, I many times have missed assignments, but it's not because I wasn't, wasn't capable of shooting it. Um, for the most part, we leave that to the editors. Our job is to record, and then we take that to our editors, and they make their decisions. Um, there are some images that we take, say, of crime scenes, where it's mm, kind of graphic. And we still take those images, but we don't publish those on purpose. Um, I will give an example. There was a suicide that was deemed a suicide uh, last couple of months ago. Someone jumped off the uh, overpass into the tracks. I was dispatched. I took photos of the crime scene, but we, our editors found out that it was a suicide. We didn't publish that. We didn't go with the story. With this, there are some lines that we don't cross, and I, I appreciate the work that our editors do. But our job is to record history, and we get together and we come to a consensus about what's to publish and not. So from a sports photographer's perspective, I miss photos all the time. Uh, and yes, I wish I had gotten a lot of those photos, but that's kind of the nature of things where sometimes, sometimes you just don't get them. And a lot of the times as a sports photographer, you, you have to be like the athletes that you photograph. And if you make a mistake, you have to forget about it because there's no use in dwelling on what you've missed. Yeah, I feel like it's innumerable <laughs> amounts of missed <laughs> moments. But my motto is like, it, with video, it's like, if you didn't shoot it, it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> so you just move on. <laughs> Question is how much gear you haul around and how you manage that with all the different lenses and lights and things. Well, I have one of those folding wagons from Costco. Um, that comes in handy. Um, and then I, I usually I have like a waterproof duffel bag because it's kind of like unreal how often I find myself in wet situations. <laughs> I guess it's not that surprising around here, but um, I have this waterproof duffel bag that helps me just carry like my camera and stuff. And, and yeah, the wagon really comes in handy. Um, honestly, um, the traditional uh, the traditional gear is two cameras, two lenses, maybe a third in a bag uh, that we carry. So you might see a photographer with two ca a camera on each shoulder, uh, and then maybe a bag with uh, a flash and another lens in there. So a short, a long, a medium, and a flash in a bag, maybe a backpack or a waist pack. That's usually my standard gear, uh, standard outfit. And if it's not my waist bag, I have a sling bag. And I'm just going to say, I shop for a lot of camera bags. So I still haven't got that quite bag right. I mean, my wife says, you're getting another bag? Yes, I'm getting another bag. This one just doesn't do it right. And if you're a photographer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, there's a lot of head shaking in here. <laughs> she won't talk about this, but I will tell you, sports, when I've I do a lot of sports. I'm the third string. They don't like for me to say that, but I'm the third string shooter. When she's sick or Dino's sick or they're out of town, I have to fill in. So I have... Uh, Rough life. What? Rough life. I know, right? <laughs> Free food at Seahawks, which is actually pretty good. So we also, there's the two cameras that we carry daily, and then there's actually a third camera and a larger lens that we usually carry. And then there's another lens you usually have in your waist bag or in your pocket or something like that. And sometimes if you're feeling, really feeling froggy, you have a strobe. So yeah, there's, it can get hefty, but it's something you get used to. It's, it's similar to a carpenter with their tool bag, their tool, tool box, their tool belt. It's just something you get used to. Question is, what are the guidelines for editing photos, cropping and such? Um, I will say from having worked at the desk for many, many years that um, when we're editing photos, we're, we're, as far as the moment goes, you know, we're looking for those peak moments, um, those moments that really tell the story. And sometimes cropping a photo will um, get a reader just right into the subject matter that we want them to see. Um, we don't do much at all, you know, technically, we don't, we don't change a whole lot, maybe lighten or darken things, but other than that, when we crop photos and such, we do it to 
either fill a particular space and you know sometimes when you know that a, photo a photo is going to be a, a main lead photo um, you're going to maybe let it be a little bit wider a little looser than if you know it's going to fill a small space in which case we want to crop it a little tighter so the question is um, for the paper tomorrow and the number of picture, uh, photos in it, how many are actually taken that don't make it? Um, <laughs> hundreds, thousands, it depends on the day and what we've been shooting, but at the very least, hundreds into the thousands. If you're at a, a ball game, Jenny can speak to that. So at a Seahawks football game, I will shoot over 10,000 pictures. Mm -hmm. Of those 10,000 pictures, I will only look at a couple hundred, and you will only see eight. So that's, that's you know, the extreme range of things, but that's kind of how sports works. We take the vast majority of my pictures are absolute garbage. <laughs> it's just how it is. If, if you get one good photo a week on the sports beat, you're like, oh, I made it. Okay, okay, good. So the question is, uh, with the happy moments, sad moments, the range of emotions that you photograph, how do you, how do you deal with that? You go with them. I will say um, you smile with them, you cry with them, um, and at the end of the day, you say thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for allowing us to do this. Because you have to remember, the people that we photograph, they're not getting paid for this. They're volunteering their time, their story, their name for whatever we're there for. So you go on that journey with them. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's, it's, it's happy. Sometimes it's glad. And I've been to funerals where I cry my eyes out. I've been to people's homes where I've laughed so hard I thought it was in front of a stand-up comedian. So it, you, you, everything in between. So you go with them on their journey and say, thank you very much. Um, I would say one of the challenges of like video storytelling is when you do have those sad or, you know, impactful stories, you kind of have, you end up watching it over and over again. Like the interviews you do, you go through them again and again. And, um, that can, I think part of it's just recognizing that it can have that sort of vicarious effect on you. Um, and I think, you know, the type of work we do, I think the variety really helps. So like after you've worked on something that's pretty heavy or emotionally taxing, you can pivot and go to the Seattle CAC convention. <laughs> like, and, and that's nice, that feels nice. It's like a shower for your brain and your heart. Um, and our, our Bosses are really understanding about that too and make sure that we're not getting inundated with um, like negative stuff all the time because they understand. So that's, that's a key thing as well. Question is what inspired each of us to choose photography as a career? Shooting pictures is fun. It just, uh, there's no other way to describe it. I, it's, it's the best. In, and none of us are here for the money, that's very clear. But also we're not here, we're, we're not starving. We're making a living doing what we love to do. And we do it every day. I, I can't imagine, you know, I, obviously I'm in this career and, ha and having a wonderful time, but like someone is paying me to go take pictures. And that is just, that just blows my mind. It, it, it's the best, it's absolutely the best. And I haven't photographed a cat convention, but I should because I think that would be amazing as well. <laughs> um, my story is a little bit more easier. I was going to be a writer. I was going to be a journalist. Uh, and when I was in high school, all my teachers said I should be a writer. Uh, one day the AIDS quilt came to Nathan Hale High School in 94. And she said, hey, here's your assignment for the school newspaper and go write a story about it. And by the way, here's my Canon Rebel. Go take a photo of it for your story. I never used that thing in my life. I didn't, my brother was in the photography class, so he was going to develop my film. After playing with this thing and making it go zzz, 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 and I had no idea what I was doing, I got maybe one or two pictures on some black and white film, gave it to him to publish, uh, to develop, and got back, and this picture of the AIDS quilt ran in the school newspaper with my article. 
that I wrote. And I went, oh, I better learn photography. I guess my answer is similar to Jenny's, where it's just, it's, it's a really interesting way to interact with the world. Um, I guess, like, I, and you kind of go through ebbs and flows, I think, in the work of, like, you know, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> I think, like anyone else, you know, and, like, creative pursuits and everything. But, like, recently I was filming an assignment, you know, from a fishing boat in Elliott Bay, and I was just like, my job's so cool. Like, I would never be doing this if it wasn't this, like, very interesting job that I have. So it really, I found, like, in grad school that it, really opened up the world in a different way and led me to experiences I wouldn't otherwise have and opened my perspective and, and yeah, it gets a little bit addictive. <laughs> the question is, have you had those aha moments where you know it's meant to be and you're taking pictures for a reason? That's a really hard question. <laughs> I think the aha moment comes from when you get back from your assignment when you look at your stuff and you're like, wow, I didn't mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> like, aha, that, there's, there's the photo. It, it, it's a great feeling. It's very gratifying. You've, you've done your job well that day. I, but that's a difficult question. G give me more time with that. <laughs> um, I'll give you a recent aha moment. Uh, did anybody see the Sunday paper this past Sunday? I had the Cormorant story. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Um, so, if anybody didn't know, printing is expensive. Ink is expensive. When someone wants to pay you to create for your images to print expensively on paper, something that is going to last for a long time, archive, that's an aha moment. Like, oh wow, I did that. That's me that they're reading about. That's me that they pushed my images to go along with the story that thousands of people are going to read in a physical newspaper. Uh, I want to give a quick example. I was reading this book, and they're talking about how digital can be changed where when you print something on paper, it cannot. And I think that's so important to me. That's why I enjoy working for the paper, because that's my aha moment. When I see that big cormorant on the in Sunday paper, <laughs> Aha! <laughs> this is why I do that, and I love it. All right. Thank you.